Hey everyone, it's Dr. Wood, and today we're going to be covering the second part of our topic on endocrinology. And so, the um, majority of this is going to be covering our talk on type 2 diabetes. We talked a lot about insulin last time, and certainly that may be a component of the treatment regimen for patients with type 2 diabetes, but it's certainly not the first thing you start them off with. And so, we're going to kind of walk through that um, in terms of what these patients will be going through from a medication standpoint. It's important to know that we're going to talk about the monotherapy and things that are good to start out diabetic patients in, and then we'll look at using combination therapy with oral medications most likely, and then we'll talk about combo drugs um, using either some injectable products or maybe even going with injectable insulin as sort of our last line there. So we'll look at the different kind of pluses and minuses of these different medications and we'll kind of come up with a treatment plan for what we think might be appropriate for different types of patients um, with type 2 diabetes. So one of the big problems we're going to see with these patients here, and these graphs sort of show this, is that we kind of have a couple different problems that are going on with patients with diabetes. And so one of the first ones is going to be obviously, yeah, they have higher plasma glucose levels. So you can see here a patient with type 2 diabetes, much higher than someone with, say, normal glucose tolerance or even those who are on the road towards type 2 diabetes with impaired glucose tolerance. And so one of the big reasons for that is actually as a result of not only insulin resistance at the cell itself, but also going to be related to the decrease in insulin that they're actually producing. And you can see here the person with impaired glucose tolerance is certainly um, getting higher levels of insulin being released, but eventually you can wear out that pancreas such to the point that you'll end up having decreased uh, levels of insulin being secreted here. And again, it makes good sense why some of these patients end up going on insulin because that's kind of the only thing they can replace what they happen to be missing, especially with more kind of progressive cases. Um, other issues you're gonna run into, why these patients are having elevated levels of glucose in the bloodstream is not only related to insulin, which we can see here being blunted, as compared to some of the normal glucose tolerance, but you're also gonna see that you don't have the sort of um, uh, decrease in glucagon levels you would expect to see after a patient received a glucose load. So here in this, um, you can look at the time frame here, but patients are getting a glucose bolus essentially, um, either through food or say with an IV dose. And what you see here with a patient with normal glucose tolerance is they should get a decrease in glucagon being secreted from those alpha cells in the pancreas, whereas some with type 2 diabetes, they don't have that same decrease there. So not only do they have lower levels of insulin, they also have higher levels of glucagon, both of which can exacerbate that elevated blood sugar that they're experiencing. So we'll get into the different major types of medications we'll use for these patients, and we'll talk about ones that, one, make the pancreas secrete more insulin on their own. We'll talk about things that sensitize the body to insulin, or they'll make better use of the insulin the patient's already releasing. We'll talk about some things that may slow down the absorption of carbohydrates from the GI tract. We'll talk about some things that help to suppress glucagon and these are going to be our incretins we'll talk about later. And then the newest class, we'll actually talk about things that can block reabsorption of glucose from the actual kidneys themselves. So a lot of different ways to skin the cat, so to speak, and let's look at the different options here and kind of how relatively effective they are. And you can see that with any of these, they're going to have varying degrees of efficacy here. Um, things like, you know, your biguanides like metformin, things like sulfonylureas, you're going to get kind of the most bang for your buck, which is why most patients end up starting on these uh, for the most part, as we'll see going forward. So first set of drugs I want to talk about are the sulfonylureas. These are oral hypoglycemics. And basically their job is to make the pancreas secrete more insulin. And we'll talk about why that is in just a moment. Uh, for the most part, you're going to see more of the second generation agents being used here, typically because their side effect profile is a little better than uh, some of the first generation agents. And so the main ones you're going to run into include things like lamepiride, glipizide, and then gliburide. And you can see here's a lot of different brand names for them. Um, some of these are going to be extended release preparations. Some of them are not. Um, and so that can have an effect on how frequently you're dosing the drugs. The mechanism for the sulfonylurea is essentially working similar to what glucose normally does in the beta cells of the pancreas. So you can have glucose come in here. We recall that it gets metabolized into ATP, which causes closure of these potassium channels. This increase in positive potential within the cell causes a depolarization, which allows for these voltage-gated calcium channels to open, calcium flows in, and then stimulates exocytosis of insulin vesicles from the cell. Well, the sulfonylurea is just basically come in and close this potassium channel on its own and causes that depolarization. So even if you didn't have high levels of glucose around, this could still directly stimulate 
increasing the release of insulin there. Um, some other byproducts you're gonna see include things like decreased amounts of glucose being produced from the liver. You may see some increase in insulin receptor sensitivity and overall decreases in glucagon levels. So all of which can be very beneficial to your patients in order of getting their blood sugar under control. You'll find that most of these are going to be extensively metabolized in the liver, which may be an issue if they have a history of liver dysfunction. So you do want to be wary of that. Um, also keep in mind uh, that they are excreted in the urine, so that can, may be an issue from renal dysfunction as well. Not only that, but also the insulin they're releasing is partially cleared by the kidneys, and we know that that also increases the half-life if they have renal dysfunction. Um, so again, be cautious when using it in patients with organ dysfunction. Um, not an absolute contraindication there. So um, we're gonna see that with the, the biggest issue with the Cephalani is, is basically hypoglycemia is gonna be the biggest risk, which can be potentially deadly in, in patients. And so the reason why we don't like a lot of these older agents is because of the long half-life and, and side effects you see with things like disulfiram reactions with chlorpropamide wasn't great from that standpoint. And so nowadays we're using the second gen agents we're talking about. And typically the longer lasting they are, the more likely they are to cause hypoglycemia, especially in a delayed sort of sense. So things like gliburide can still be uh, more likely to cause that in certain patients. But just to give you some examples of other ones we see here, things like lemeparide. Um, again, you'll see these either being used by themselves or we can use them in conjunction with other agents. So for instance, you could use this with insulin because not only will it cause the patient's own beta cells to release more insulin, but this is, or I'm sorry, the cephalonia reason will cause the beta cells to release more insulin. That can work synergistically with exogenous insulin we're also giving them. Um, so you get better rapid glucose control, but remember this may enhance the hypoglycemic effects of these medications. Other things include things like glipizide or gliburide. Um, they can be used. Glucotrol XL is a pretty common one. That one's really kind of interesting because the, the tablet itself um, doesn't disintegrate in the GI tract. So patients will actually see it um, coming out in the stools. And the reason why it works is that it's actually a tablet with a little tiny hole drilled into it. And actually osmotic pressure in the GI tract causes the drug to be slowly released throughout a 24 hour period or so. So uh, patients may say, oh, the drug didn't work. It, you know, I can see the tablet in my stool. That's actually just how the drug is designed there. Um, again, using some of the shorter half-life typically has a little less hypoglycemia associated with it. So as I mentioned, hypoglycemia being a risk, but weight gain is also going to happen here because that increase in insulin is going to cause all that extra glucose to be stored in the body and in adipose tissue. And so weight gain is a very common side effect, which may be problematic if the patient's already overweight to begin with, right? Um, other things you can see rarely include things like in a rash, pruritus, maybe some blood dyscrasias, but pretty, um, pretty fairly tolerated except for the hypoglycemia risk. You do want to watch out for that. Make sure, you know, if patients are going to skip a meal that they are going to be watching their blood sugar or be aware of the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Um, keep in mind that you may see resistance over time and this is going to be uh, as a result of uh, basically the beta cells in the pancreas sort of wearing out and uh, they're basically not being as much insulin to release anymore. Some contraindications, be they have type 1 diabetes because they can't produce any glucose or insulin on their own. Um, we typically will not use these for pregnancy or breastfeeding if possible. Um, they may be used occasionally, but typically we like to avoid it. And then obviously DKA, this is not going to be used to treat that ever. Um, be aware of the interactions in terms of things like protein binding or other drugs may kick it off of serum proteins and cause the drugs to be more effective. And if you have other medications that cause hyperglycemia, say for instance, something like um, Sudafed, which activates, uh, you know, uh, causes release of catecholamines and causes activation of things like beta uh, receptors on the liver, that, that they can counteract one another and make the drugs less effective. And then with corpropamide, we mentioned that disulfiram reaction. This is similar to a flagell where it causes basically reaction flushing reactions you see with alcohol. So very similar to the sulfonylureas will be the megalitonides. Um, these are going to be um, doing the same thing essentially. They're going to be causing increase in release from the beta cells of the pancreas of insulin. Um, there's two in this category called repaglinide and the teglinide. The main difference you're going to see between these and the sulfonylureas is that the insulin release is going to be relative to the glucose level. So you're going to basically find that these really only work when the patients have ingested glucose. So if they're around mealtime, this is when these drugs are gonna work. When blood sugar levels are spiking, these drugs will make more insulin release from the beta cells. If the patient has not eaten recently, they don't have high blood sugar levels, then these drugs are not gonna be that effective. 
And so you're gonna see here that these need to be taken before mealtime. So typically within say 30 minutes, 10 minutes, depending on the agent you're using there. And you're gonna see this being basically effective for around three to four hours around that mealtime bolus and glucose. So as you might imagine, you're gonna see better effects from the sulfonylureas than you would these agents, but maybe because these are short acting, you're less likely to see maybe as much weight gain or you're less likely to see as much hypoglycemia. I'll tell you, they're not gonna be as commonly used as the sulfonylureas, but they are an alternative agent that's out there. And of course, if you miss a meal, go ahead and skip the dose. That's a good education point for those patients there. Hypoglycemia weight gain to a lesser degree than sulfonylureas, but still a risk there. And of course, some other minor things, you know, watch out for some minor headache, nausea, things like that. Um, and be careful patients with liver dysfunction because you may see prolonged action of the drugs and that could lead to more hypoglycemia. So the biggest class we're gonna see here, or at least the most commonly used in type two diabetics are gonna be the biguanides. Um, basically, there's only one agent in this category that we're gonna be using, and that's gonna be metformin, which is either known as glucophage or glucophage XL uh, for an extended release preparation. And you will typically see that most type two diabetic patients, unless they have a contraindication, will start a metformin first, and we'll mention why that is in a moment. But you're also gonna see it in using a lot of combinations because it performs the actions of having, uh, basically being a nice backbone to any uh, diabetic regimen where you can add on things to it and it only works synergistically. So for instance, here's a couple of sulfon areas you can mix it with in order to get better control of A1C and, and blood sugar levels. Basically, the uh, metformin works as a insulin sensitizer. It doesn't have one direct mechanism, but some things that it will do include things like decreasing hepatic glucose production. It will help with peripheral glucose uptake and utilization. So basically it's an insulin sensitizer along for the tissue insulin or the insulin that the patient is releasing to be working more effectively. And it can also do things like decreasing glucose absorption from the GI tract. So kind of attacking the problem from several different um, standpoints. And then the nice thing here is there's very limited hypoglycemia. And as a result of that, because it's not doing anything to increase insulin levels directly, you're also gonna find that it has very little weight gain associated with it. Uh, in fact, you may actually have a little bit of weight loss associated with the drug, which is only beneficial in many of these type two diabetic patients. So in terms of kinetics, you're gonna find here that um, even though metformin itself is not gonna be metabolized in the liver, you are gonna still see the hepatic disease contraindicated due to the issue, issue of lactic acid, which we'll kind of expound upon in a few moments. Um, you will find that this drug is un excreted unchanged in the kidneys, and this is really important because patients who have renal dysfunction um, are actually gonna be contraindicated from receiving this drug as a result of some lactic acid concerns we'll see in just a few minutes here. Um, and so you'll find that again, this is gonna be basically really helpful for patients who may be obese, and so should have pretty high insulin resistance um, because of the fact that it may lead to no weight gain or actually a little bit of weight loss. And it's just a really good all around agent that's gonna be very beneficial for most type two diabetic patients. In terms of adverse effects, it can be pretty rough on the stomach. So you may see a lot of things like nausea, vomiting associated with this, anorexia, constipation. Um, so because of that, you do wanna make sure that we either are taking this with meals to help out with that, or we may use Excel formulations to allow it to work over a, a slower period throughout the day. So that way they don't get such peak dose effects from that. But most patients can tolerate this without too much incident of unbearable GI effects. Now, the issue we're gonna see here is that this lactic acidosis that can develop from the result of retaining too much metformin, um, they're gonna find that they may have this buildup where they can't either clear the lactic acid through metabolism in the liver or they can't clear it through the kidneys themselves. And so we see this as well if patients have an acute decrease in renal function, say for instance, they go for surgery or say for instance, they get a contrast uh, as a result of an imaging study uh, that can cause an acute kidney injury. So basically they build up levels of metformin that causes lactic acidosis to occur. And I've seen several patients actually die from this uh, because patients were either not uh, being watched for their renal function uh, and they end up holding on to too much metformin and, and this occurs here. So that's the one thing we we're really concerned about with that. Rash is also a possibility and also you can develop an anemia, even though this is pretty rare. This is as a result of having decreased B12 absorption. So as I mentioned, contraindications, typically renal disease is going to be the big thing here. So if their GFR is less than 30 mLs a minute, we just don't use metformin for those patients. We used to do it based off of the serum creatinine values, but that's not really been all that useful for us. So we just go off the GFR basically. 
If they have severe hepatic disease, I'd probably also avoid this as well, or any degree of or metabolic acidosis already occurring, you would want to discontinue the medication then. Um, typically, we would stop this medication, usually withholding it before surgery, um, You know, especially if you have time, if it's an elective sort of thing. Um, we would go ahead and hold it before surgery, and then at least 48 hours afterwards, uh, mainly due to the risk of having an increased lactic acid as a result of that surgery. So that's certainly something you want to be wary of. Um, and again, you may think, well, what about the patient's, uh, patient's blood sugar? It might be elevated. We can control for that. We can give them insulin if we really need to, if they're in the hospital. Um, that form is not gonna be one of those mandatory meds they have to continue. So next up, we're gonna talk about our thiazolidinodienes. Um, you can call them TZDs, it's a lot easier here. Um, two main agents we're gonna see being used, including pioglitazone and then rosiglitazone. And this is basically gonna be working as an agonist for this peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma, or otherwise known as PPAR gamma. And basically this is gonna be regulating sort of transcription of insulin responsive genes. So if you have more transcription of those genes, more insulin sensitive proteins are being produced there. And so ultimately you're gonna find that the cells are gonna be more responsive to insulin, it's gonna help with that sensitization there, that most of those patients have become resistant to insulin. This is gonna be able to help out with that. So ultimately what you'll find with the TZDs is you're gonna have an increase in peripheral glucose uptake and utilization, meaning you have better insulin sensitivity, and you're actually gonna have decrease in hepatic glucose production. Uh, overall, you're gonna find this may take several weeks to really kick in and be affected, and that's mainly because of the fact um, that uh, it's causing changes in transcription to genes, and that can be a little bit of a slower process. Kind of think about how corticosteroids take some time to kick in and work. This is kind of a similar thing you'll see here. Whereas other agents are gonna be almost immediately effective, things like metformin, your sulfonylureas, this one is probably gonna take the longest to really work. So other things to be uh, cautious with for these patients includes if they have a history of CHF, mainly because these can cause some degree of fluid retention, edema, and kind of this expanded blood volume. So you wanna be careful with that. And then make sure to watch things like their, uh, their lipid profile because they can be altered here while they're on these medications. Um, liver dysfunction is a risk when they're on this. So you do wanna watch for that. Um, you know, typically you may watch it for the, every two months or so for the first year, and then you can ex uh, extend it out beyond that if uh, assuming everything is normal. And then typically if we do see increases in our LFTs, especially like three times above normal, we just go ahead and stop the drug at that point. So recall, you know, you may be using these in conjunction with things like metformin. So you do wanna watch that interaction there. If this is causing hepatic dysfunction, you have metformin causing increased lactic acid levels, that can be a pretty uh, dangerous combination there. So so again, just be cautious and monitor these patients as appropriate. So one thing to note here is that a lot of patients will, um, or providers will shy away from rosiglitazone because there is some risk that when you combine a lot of these studies here together, that there's an increase for risk of myocardial infarction um, and death from cardiovascular, um, uh, cardiovascular causes. So I would say if patients have a high risk cardiovascular history, the TZDs and especially rosiglitazone would probably be an agent I'd want to avoid in those patients there. So just something to kind of think about from that standpoint is again, what's the history? What kind of comorbid conditions are they have and what makes them maybe not a good candidate for these type of medications. Uh, next, we have our alpha glucosidase inhibitors. And so these are gonna be um, a carbose and miglitol are the two agents here. And basically they're gonna work as inhibitors of alpha amylase and this alpha glucosidase enzymes. And those are enzymes that actually reside within the brush border of the GI tract. And overall, it helps with preventing the breakdown of larger sugar molecules. And they um, will leave these molecules much larger and then unable to be absorbed through the GI tract. So overall, less glucose glucose absorption is occurring here. Now the alpha glucosidase inhibitors for the most part have pretty limited um, a systemic exposure, especially with a carbose that's not actually get absorbed at all is metabolized by intestinal bacteria. Um, and you'll find that you wanna take these drugs with the first bite of each meal. The reason for that being um, is that that's when most of the sugar is coming into the GI tract and that's when it's gonna have its greatest effect. Uh, Miglitol can cause some small degree of liver dysfunction. So you may wanna watch for that, especially in combination with other drugs. And then you'll typically not see these being used as first line or used as monotherapy because they kind of have limited efficacy as compared to some other agents, but you may find they're being used synergistically either with insulin or other oral agents like metformin, for instance. So in terms of side effects, the reason why most patients don't like this is gonna be due to the fact that all those extra sugars in the GI tract not having been absorbed, well, they're gonna get metabolized by bacteria, especially in the colon. And when sugars are being broken down by bacteria, that does produce things like CO2. So uh, patients are gonna get very gassy from this. And so flatulence is gonna be pretty common. 
um, diarrhea is quite common, and then also abdominal pain can occur here as well just due to cramping and, and things like that. So you would not want to use this in patients with things like inflammatory bowel disease, if they have any kind of obstruction, I would probably just go ahead and, and avoid these medications here. But if you're looking for something that has limited systemic exposure, this may be useful for patients like, uh, say, pregnant patients who you don't want to have a lot of drug exposure to the fetus, something like a carbos could be a really good option for those patients. So next up, let's talk about the incretins. This is another hormone that's really important in terms of glucose metabolism uh, and, and glucose levels and regulation in the body here. Um, so one of the things I want you to notice here is that incretin is a hormone that normally gets uh, released as a result of oral glucose stimulation. So if I intake a starchy meal, if I were to go to Dunkin' Donuts and get a nice starchy donut uh, full of sugar, um, I'm going to cause incretin to be released uh, as a result of that. What's interesting is if you give an IV bolus of glucose, it actually doesn't cause much increase in incretin levels like the oral does. So this is something that um, is going to be interesting in terms of affecting how we consume food. And we're going to see this has a big effect on things like satiety as a result of oral ingestion of carbohydrates. So incretins, uh, there's a couple of different ones that fall into this category. Glucagon-like peptide 1 is probably going to be the, the main one we're talking about here. Um, and so what you find is that it will be released as a result of an increase in glucose as a result of a meal. Um, and you're going to find that it does several things here. So for one, it's going to cause an increase in insulin release from the pancreas. And it's also going to cause a decrease in gastric emptying and food intake. And that's mainly because it actually helps with satiety. It actually helps to stimulate that part of the brain that says, hey, I have enough food here. I don't need to ingest any more. And so as a result, you're going to also see that um, GLP-1 has to be metabolized by some way. It has to get out of the system somehow. And that's going to be through an enzyme called dipeptidyl peptidase 4 or DPP-4. So you're going to find there's two ways we can affect the system. We can either give more drugs that act like GLP-1 to act as a supplement for that, or we're going to find that we can actually try to decrease the metabolism of GLP-1 by inhibiting this enzyme here. So we have different drug classes that can help out with that. So here's a nice slide kind of showing you the different effects here where GLP-1 as a result of ingesting food is going to promote satiety. It's going to help to decrease gastric emptying so that way the patient feels fuller. And you're also going to be seeing more insulin secretion coming out from the pancreas and decreased levels of glucagon. So all of these things are going to help out to make sure our blood sugar is going to stay under control um, more effectively. And what you're going to find with diabetic patients is, is that they actually have a decrease in the amount of GLP-1 they're releasing over time. So as I mentioned, you're going to find type 2 diabetic patients have not only decreased levels of GLP-1, but also levels of insulin as well. And again, as a result of this, we see that exacerbates that increase in glucagon after meals they have as well. So again, all these things are kind of exacerbating one another, as you will see. And so if we can try to replace that or maybe try to enhance the effects of whatever GLP-1 that patient has, overall, we're going to have uh, several very interesting, very beneficial effects for these patients here. And again, just kind of giving you an idea of what it looks like with a type 2 diabetic patient, you're seeing their glucagon levels being elevated. Some of this is related to the fact they have decreased levels of GLP-1, um, especially with the more kind of uh, long-standing type 2 diabetics. Here's an example of what the GLP-1 levels look like between some of the normal glucose tolerance say after breakfast um, versus someone who has type 2 diabetes. And you see there's a marked decrease in those levels there. So again, we can either give things to replace it or we can give things to try to prevent the breakdown and allow levels to be higher as a result of it having a longer half-life. So, what I have here is a picture of a Gila monster, and this is another uh, medication that actually has a pretty interesting animal uh, sort of origin. We've talked about you know things like salmon having a source for uh, drugs, and we talked about plants, but this is the first reptile I think we've seen that gives us a medication here. And so um, this is actually going to be the first drug of the incretin mimetics, or drugs that act in the place of GLP-1. And the first one we had here was exenatide or bieta, and this is actually something we were able to get from the saliva of a Gila monster. There's actually 53% homology with our GLP-1, right? So it's kind of weird to think about a lizard, their spit having this protein that has half of the homology exactly of our uh, same proteins there. It's a pretty interesting sort of similarities between our species. Um, 
Now, when will we give this? Well, well basically, this is going to be for your type 2 diabetic patients who maybe are taking metformin and sulfonylureas, but really are not achieving adequate control with their A1C and blood sugar levels. Um, we're also going to find this is really handy in terms of weight loss. So because they cause satiety and because they're decreasing gastric emptying and all that, patients feel fuller and they just don't have the desire to eat. I had, a, I had an uncle who was very overweight with type 2 diabetes who ended up losing something like 100 pounds when he got put on one of these medications because he just didn't feel hungry. He just didn't want to eat. Issues with these drugs, though, is that these are going to be protein-based because it's looking like a hormone that we produce. And so because of that, it's actually going to be an injectable-only product. So that is one downside to that, that patients do have to inject themselves. Now, exenatide was the first one we had, and so you actually had to inject yourself twice daily, and which was not great, especially if you're already using something like insulin um, in order to you know uh, control blood sugars. There's a lot of injections going on with this. Looking at the effect here, we're gonna see is that when looking at patients with their um, insulin levels, uh, looking at someone say with the healthy control, normally you'd see if they get an IV glucose load here, yeah, you see uh, that they should have an increase in insulin levels. And looking at a patient getting placebo with type two diabetes, you can see here, they really don't have that big spike in insulin like you would imagine seeing uh, because they have type two diabetes versus when you gave them exenatide, this was really able to help out and get them um, to have a lot more glucose dependent insulin secretion. And so again, it's getting them back to normal essentially in terms of how their body should be responding to elevated glucose levels. So some side effects you're gonna see with these drugs include things like nausea and vomiting. Some of this is related to that decreased gastric emptying. They may be trying to eat the same amount they normally do and not realizing that that stuff's not moving out of the stomach as quickly and thus that can, can lead to some nausea and vomiting. You're unlikely to see hypoglycemia with this class by itself, but more likely to see it if the patient is also on a sulfonylurea like gliburide. Uh, you may find this delays absorption of other medications as a result of uh, gastro, uh, gastric emptying times being slowed. And then you should see weight loss with this, which is good for a lot of patients, may not be good for every patient. And then interestingly enough, this is one of those rare classes of the drugs that can cause pancreatitis. So again, this would be a concern for your patients that they're presenting with really severe abdominal pain. You would wanna rule this out. So since then, since um, uh, Exenatide, we've had a couple of other agents that help out by having a longer half-life and such that the times they need to be injected also has been decreased. So Loraglutide, Dulaglutide, then Albiglutide. Um, these are nice because if you're looking at um, the last two here, they're only injected one time weekly. So it's actually very beneficial from a compliance standpoint. So again, all that is, is to help out. Of course, they're newer, so they're likely more expensive. So it depends on what the patient can pay for or what their insurance is actually gonna cover. So we mentioned there's ways that we can uh, replace the GLP-1 by giving an incretin mimetic, but what's the other side of the equation? Helping to prevent the breakdown of GLP-1 that the patient's already releasing. And this is where we're gonna have our DPP-4 inhibitors or dipeptidyl peptidase uh, inhibitors. And basically they're gonna be preventing the breakdown of these um, incretins, things like GLP-1 and, and um, GIP, uh, along with some other proteins here that uh, may have some effects on the drug's actions, but not really clinically all that useful. Uh, GLP-1 is a big thing we're going to be seeing here. And uh, basically, we have drugs like alagliptin, citagliptin, saxagliptin, and linagliptin. Um, the benefit with these is that they're all oral, but you're not going to find that they're nearly as effective as giving an incretin mimetic. But they're also likely to be a lot cheaper, too, so that's going to be kind of the trade-off between these. Um, there is risk for things like diarrhea and headache, um, but the other big thing you're going to see is the risk for Stevens-Johnson, so you do want to watch out for that um, in patients who are taking one of these DPP-4 inhibitors. And so just to give you an example of what it looks like when you're getting the synergy from these medications, you can see either giving citagliptin by itself, metformin by itself, or then looking at the combination of the two here, you do see that synergy there. So again, these drugs can work in combination to get much better increases um, in compliance uh, with your regimens, getting them to goal in terms of lowering A1C and getting their, their blood sugars under, under control. And just to give you an example of a, com a comparison between GLP-1 agonists like your exenatides and your DPP-4 inhibitors, um, you can see here that overall GLP-1 agonists are going to be much more effective, um, but they are injectables and you may worry about things like antibody formation where patients may either develop anaphylaxis or there's a risk that they develop more like um, IgG antibodies that actually may um, just bind them up and, and neutralize them. So that's one downside there with time. Um, and then of course you don't really see any of those risks uh, associated with that. Um, no real big weight loss you're going to see with the DPP-4 inhibitors, which is another downside. But also remember there's that risk of Stevens-Johnson. So a handy slide to kind of look and compare between the two classes.
So the newest class that we have here is our SGLT2 inhibitors. Basically, this is a transporter you're going to find in the renal tubules that is normally responsible for uh, reabsorbing filtered glucose in the proximal convoluted tubule. And what this is going to do is actually inhibit that process so that you will filter glucose from the glomerulus, but you don't reabsorb it. So you basically just urinate it all out. And so this will help out with lowering blood sugar because you're just peeing out the sugar. And then also will, can help out with that body weight because again, if that sugar is not there to actually be stored in the body in the adipose tissue for later, then you just you lose that weight, which is nice. Um, so there are a couple of drugs in this category, including canagliflozin, dipagliflozin, and then impagliflozin. And again, whoever named these drugs um, obviously did not say them out loud because they are very kind of awkward to say, but you have things like Invokana and Jardian, which has a much better sort of uh, ring to them, I think. Anyway, adverse effects associated with these, and again, remember these are the newest group of drugs, so um, you're gonna find we will still be discovering things as time goes on. But what's interesting is all that extra sugar coming out through the urinary tract means that you have a big risk for fungal infections, right? Um, about 10% of your patients may develop a fungal urinary tract infection, which is not great. Really think about like maybe immunocompromised patients developing this, so this is a pretty unique sort of side effect here. Also, you can develop things like hypotension. And you do also worry about things like having risk for fractures because of effects it can have on things like uh, calcium potentially in the kidneys. So you do want to be cautious with that. Make sure you're watching these patients. And also, um, because of the fact that they're peeing out all this extra glucose, if they have an overall decrease in insulin release or insulin levels, you can't actually develop a diabetic ketoacidosis. But what's interesting is actually euglycemic because even though um, they would be hyperglycemic because they don't have any insulin to really shuttle this glucose into the cells, they're peeing it all out. And so they're actually into being euglycemic. So another kind of unique side effect with these drugs here. So this is a really handy table, I think, to give you a comparison between the different agents and sort of what to start patients on, what risk to look for, and overall efficacy and costs associated with the drugs here. So again, for most patients, they're gonna start out with metformin because it has a very low hypoglycemia risk. It's gonna have um, basically good efficacy at lowering A1C. It's gonna have neutral to, to weight loss effects. But again, remember to look for the GI issues and the lactic acidosis, especially with renal dysfunction. And it's low cost, it's been around forever. Question, what do you do next? Well, you kind of have your choice in terms of what you're looking for. So you can do any of these different options here in terms of um, adding on to metformin for your patients. So for instance, if you had a patient who's overweight, maybe using something like uh, a GLP-1 agonist would be appropriate. Or maybe if they don't really have finances to afford something like that, maybe start them on something like a Safonaria but just know that your risk for hypoglycemia is even higher, right? So be able to kind of look through that and be able to compare the two because I may give you a question on a test that says, hey, yeah, this type of patient, these are their comorbid conditions, what's, what's the next best agent to start for them? You should be able to kind of pick that out based off of the, um, the, the things we've talked about so far. In terms of triple therapy, this is where you may step it up and utilizing like metformin with a sulfonylurea plus a TZD, right? Or using some combination of three oral agents. At this time, you're probably really gonna be thinking about adding on a GLP-1 agonist or insulin at this point. Um, insulin is gonna be one of those things where patients generally when they go on it, they're probably not gonna come off of it unless they really do something to get their weight under control and get their, their blood sugar under control either with diet um, and exercise or something else. Um, and usually you'll start patients with type two diabetes on a long acting first. So you may start them on something like Atlantis one time daily in order to get them under control. Or if they still can't get, especially around meal times under control, then they may go on a basal bolus regimen where you could do a long acting plus say, you know, um, a short acting like, you know, insulin bliss pro that, you know, at meal time, for instance. Um, so again, a lot of different options here. It depends on what the patient is, what their preferences are, what they can pay for, what they're willing to do, etc. So um, again, it's kind of nice because you have so many, you're not really limited by your options, uh, fortunately. So that's it for the diabetes section. Up next, I wanna talk about thyroid pharmacology uh, briefly. And so we're gonna find that with thyroid uh, issues here, it's mainly either gonna be an issue of hyposecretion or hypersecretion. And you can actually find that it can occur at really any level of the HPA axis. Uh, it could be either at the hypothalamus, it could be at the pituitary gland or at the actual thyroid gland itself. And obviously we know there's a lot of different reasons for that occurring. Um, if a patient has hyposecretion, we're gonna see that the main way we're gonna manage that is actually by giving hormone replacement. We'll look at our options there. And then we're also gonna find in terms of hypersecretion, there are ways we can actually prevent the formation of thyroid hormone as well. We'll look at different agents that can help us with that regard.
So here's the HPA axis that I was talking about, where basically the hypothalamus is gonna be releasing thyrotropin releasing hormone onto the anterior pituitary, and that then uh, releases TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone onto the thyroid, which will then cause this negative feedback loop to occur when it releases T4 and T3. If you recall, T4 is gonna be more of like kind of the storage form. It's not really gonna be all that active. T3 is a really active form here. And again, this negative feedback loop can be affected really at either level of the hypothalamus or the um, anterior pituitary. Um, other things that are gonna stimulate this or inhibit this is actually gonna be iodine, which we'll look at more detail. This is gonna be um, absolutely essential in order to form thyroid hormone. And it's actually gonna be a good way to actually stop production of thyroid hormone as well. So it's kind of an uh, interesting double-edged sword as we'll see here going forward. So what happens in this process here, I like this drawing because it kind of shows you step by step what occurs um, when forming thyroid hormone, either T3 or T4. Um, I'll kind of walk you through the steps here, but basically iodine is going to be coming into the system and I always get iodide, iodine mixed up, so I probably will say it wrong here as well. But basically you're going to have some iodide coming in into the system here and there's this peroxidase step that occurs where basically now this is in the ready form, right? So you're going to find that iodine is able to to combine with tyrosine, which you know is an amino acid, and then you will form kind of these intermediary products called monoiodotyrosine and diiodotyrosine. It just has to do with how many iodides actually get added to it. And from there, we can actually form T4 and T3. And it will actually get bound up with this thyroglobulin as well. So it's kind of riding on this protein carrier. And eventually this proteolysis will occur where then free T4 and T3 can be released out into the bloodstream. Remember T3 can be working immediately, whereas T4 has to be converted over to T3 eventually. And again, you can see along the way, different things that can either inhibit or kind of stimulate the system. So as I mentioned, that first step is the iodide trapping. So again, transport iodide into the follicular cells and then it gets oxidized into iodine, essentially. Um, again, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of getting iodide versus iodine, right? Again, I, I probably got it wrong in the last slide as well. Um, the organification step happens here where you form this mono or diiodotyrosine. And guess what? If you have two diiodotyrosines together, two dyes is four, so that means you have T4 being made. And then if you have a diiodo and a monoiodotyrosine put together, that's T3, because then you have three iodines all together there. Um, it's important here because again you have to have iodine coming into the system in order to form thyroid hormone but a lot of these steps here by having high levels of iodide you can actually inhibit the system as well and so we're going to find some therapeutic uses to do that to actually decrease our formation of thyroid hormone so as I mentioned, once you have these all put together, you're gonna to be having some degree of it being formed as T3, and then you're gonna have a lot more of it actually being formed as T4. So you have about a five to one ratio there. Typically T4 levels are gonna be higher than T3 levels as a result of this. You can just picture kind of showing the same thing. Um, again, peripherally, you have that conversion of T4 to T3, which being the more active form. There's also some ways we can inhibit that as well. So once it's gonna be released here, it's gonna undergo um, exocytosis, gets released into the circulation, and then you're gonna have this deiodination step that occurs peripherally that allows for T4 to be converted to T3, as I mentioned, that, that more active form. So um, it's also interesting because you can actually have it turn into the incorrect form. So you can actually have uh, this reverse T3 being formed potentially, but that's in the inactive form. What we really care about is this actual normal T3 here. Here's a picture that kind of shows you what that looks like of having the correct activation step where you have the normal T3 that can interact with the cells and, and, and the nucleus as a normal hormone, or here you have the inactive form, which basically gets metabolized at some point. So looking at ways we can help to replace this, let's say we have a patient with hypothyroidism, how do we replace that? Well, um, we can either give them straight T4 we can give them straight T3, or we can give them a combination potentially. And so I'll tell you that 99 times out of 100, patients are gonna be treated with levothyroxine, which is actually T4. And you're thinking, well, that's the inactive form. Why would I wanna give that? Well, we actually find pretty stable, consistent effects with giving this. It has good absorption. Um, you'll find that um, you know, there are some interactions you have to worry about with things like food, drug interactions, like iron and calcium interfering with absorption. Um, but for the most part, it's just tried and true. We've been using it forever and we get really consistent effects out of it. Um, but be aware though, that it doesn't kick in immediately, right? T4 is gonna take a long time to work, about a week or so, because it has to be converted over into T3 peripherally.
And I'll tell you, if I ever got calls at the poison center, uh, patients were like, oh, my son got into my levothyroxine, he ate the entire bottle, for instance. Um, I'm actually not really all that concerned right at the time of ingestion because that T4 is not active. What I will do is say, hey, in a week or so, go ahead and take them in, or if you develop symptoms, and kind of see what the levels are doing at that point because that's when really a lot of that T3 should be getting formulated. So that's the most common. Synthroid, levothyroid, you'll see these most common. Lyothyronine is actually going to be T3. I've actually never seen this being used. I can't think of a time I've ever seen it used in the retail setting. Um, but this is better if you want quicker action, right? If you want a quicker onset of action, but typically it costs a lot more. And you may need more frequent dosing, whereas Synthroid is like one time a day. This may be more frequent than that. So you do want to be um, thoughtful of uh, compliance considerations. And Lytrix is actually a combination four to one ratio of T4 to T3. Some people consider this to be sort of more natural, and so that may be uh, preferential to some patients. Um, again, this is not one that I see used really ever for the most part. And why would we use these? Well, basically any reason why they have hypothyroidism. So whether it is a result of an issue with the hypothalamus, the pituitary, or the gland itself, say they have a subtotal thyroidectomy due to cancer, um, we can replace it with this stuff and that's no problem. So some of these patients, especially maybe that thyroid cancer, had the thyroid gland taken out, we can replace that for the duration of their life. So again, their mechanism, once it's released, once we have that T3, it works just like a corticosteroid would, where it actually gets into the nucleus of the cell and can bind to different um, receptor elements and then can cause changes in transcription. So for instance, we know that when you have hypothyroidism, typically metabolism is slowed, energy levels are low by giving T3, or having T4 being converted to T3, you're gonna see an increase in metabolism, see an increase in temperature, all that is related to those effects down at the nucleus. And again, this is a relatively slow process. So fixing the thyroid gland is not something you're gonna do immediately. It's gonna be something that takes, you know, weeks to months potentially. So we know that we can replace the thyroid hormone. What do we do if we have too much thyroid hormone? Say the patients are sweaty and they're tachycardic and, and they're irritated and all these things, we can give antithyroid drugs. And basically we have two here. One's called PTU or propothiouracil and then methimazole or tapazole. These are basically drugs that are gonna help to prevent the formulation of T3 and T4. Um, for the most part, these are gonna be pretty well tolerated by most patients. They're not used too, too commonly since hyperthyroidism is not as common, say hypothyroidism. Um, rarely though, you may see this agranulocytosis. So that is one thing you want to watch for. It could be at risk for infections and things like that. So CBC is maybe something you want to monitor in these patients here. Basically, the way they're going to work is they actually prevent the, the oxidation step of the iodide. So if you never have the iodide converting over into iodine, then they can never have that organification step occur, and thus they can't actually have um, T3 and T4 being made there. And so we typically would use it for things like Graves' disease potentially, or potentially we could also use it for is if we can try to shrink the thyroid gland by preventing production of T3 and T4, the, the gland starts to atrophy, and that can make it easier for the surgeons to cut out potentially. So those are the main things to think about in terms of endocrine, thyroid hormone, think about diabetes. Those are pretty common things you'll find in the majority of your patients. Um, and that'll be it for this section here. So um, I think what we're gonna try to do is have an online session on Friday. So please watch this, please get any of your questions together that you have, and we can talk about it on online, face-to-face, um, -face, so to speak, uh, via the interwebs. Uh, but if you have any other questions in the meantime, please let me know, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, bye.